In this video, we're going to discuss the photoelectric effect. Now, the photoelectric effect is another landmark experiment where classical theory failed and the beginnings of quantum mechanics started to emerge. So first, let's discuss what is the photoelectric effect. So let's take, for example, a metal surface, right? So here I've drawn out a metal surface and there are going to be electrons on the surface of that metal. If you uh, impinge on that metal surface with light, with some form of electromagnetic radiation, what will happen is that an electron can be liberated, ejected from that sur metal surface and have a, a kinetic energy, a velocity. Um, and we call that ejected electron a photo electron, right? Kind of a compound word here to denote that, you know, there was a, a, a you know, photo photon that came in and impinged on the metal surface and caused the electron to eject from that metal surface. Now, this is uh, a, a case that was a conundrum for classical theory for quite a while. So let's see what classical theory predicts and what the actual experimental uh, results were. So the classical theory um, if we look at uh, intensity and frequency and compare that to the kinetic energy of the ejected photoelectron, what classical theory predicts is that the intensity of that radiation is going to affect the kinetic energy. So, um, so electromagnetic radiation with a higher amplitude would produce can, uh, photoelectrons with a higher kinetic energy. It predicts an exponential increase with respect to intensity. And it should have, if we just think about classical waves, it should have no dependence on the frequency. The analogy I like to use to explain this, this line of thought is think about um, a, w a wave crashing to a shore, right? Like a wave from an ocean. If the wave comes in with a high enough amplitude, right? So if it's a, a really large wave, then it will have a destructive effect on anything that's on the shore of the beach, right? Regardless of how frequent that wave is, if it has a high enough amplitude, it'll cause a lot of destruction. Uh, whereas if it's a low enough amplitude, it could be really frequent. You could have a really rough wave that's coming through uh, to the shore, but if its amplitude is small enough, it still won't really do any damage. You could still have kids playing in the ocean or playing in the pool, right? So, um, so that's kind of the thinking that was brought here to this classical uh, mechanics explanation of the photoelectric effect. If the light comes in with a high enough amplitude, it'll eject a photoelectron and that photoelectron will be given more energy the larger that wave is. And it shouldn't have any dependency on the frequency. Now, what actually happened experimentally? Well, what happened experimentally was almost the mirror image of what's predicted from classical theory. Experimentally, the kinetic energy has zero dependence, no dependence on the intensity of the wave, and it actually depends heavily on the frequency of the radiation that impinges on the surface, right? So here are the experimental plots. So just kind of sketching this out, intensity, there's no dependence of, for the kinetic energy on the intensity of the wave. And if you vary the frequency, it actually increases linearly with respect to the frequency of the radiation. Now I've put here, um, I don't have it starting at zero. I have it starting at a specific point. This specific point is known as the threshold frequency. So we call this the threshold frequency. Turns out you have to uh, impinge on the surface with a specific frequency of radiation. And anything above that will increase the kinetic energy, but you have to meet that baseline threshold frequency that I'm denoting as new not here on the plot, right? So let's kind of walk through the, uh, the main insights from this experiment. So there were three main insights from the photoelectric effect. The first is that the, um, the kinetic energy of the photoelectron or the ejection of a photoelectron depends on frequency, not intensity, right? So ejection of photoelectron, 
depends on frequency, not intensity. Right, and think about how big of a paradigm shift this really is from the thinking of classical mechanics. If you've studied waves and electromagnetic radiation, then you know that the energy classically for any wave is dependent on the amplitude of that wave. So it would make sense from a classical perspective that the energy here should also depend on the intensity, but it doesn't, right? So this really flies in the face of everything, of, of all the conventional wisdom from classical mechanics about waves, right? Now, the, uh, the second insight here is that the kinetic energy uh, increases linearly uh, with the frequency, right? So the kinetic energy, and I'll just um, abbreviate it as KE, KE increases linearly with frequency, Right. So the kinetic energy is going to depend on a frequency and it's going to have a linear dependence on the frequency of the radiation, not the intensity. Um, and the third insight here is that even at very low intensities, if you come in with the right frequency, you will have an ejected photoelectron. Right. So so think about this. So if, if even if the intensity of the radiation is very low. So let's let's kind of think about it in the visible spectrum. Let's say we're in a visible spectrum and you come in it, it's it for an order in order to eject an electron from the surface, it takes blue light, right? Uh to eject the electron from the surface. You can come in with a very low intensity blue light, you will still get a photoelectron, right? Um even if you have a pale low intensity blue light, it will still eject a photoelectron whether it's very low intensity or very high intensity, right? So let's say even at low intensities, a photoelectron is ejected if it meets threshold frequency, right? So as long as it's at that threshold frequency, it could be the weakest intensity radiation, it will still eject a photoelectron, right? So that's telling you that this energy is really frequency dependent, not intensity dependent at all, right? So what these insights give us, this is really the first experimental evidence of a photon, right? So really before this, a photon was kind of a theoretical uh, construct, at least kind of explaining this um, to anyone. It, it's, it's really theoretical until you explain the photoelectric effect, right? So the energy of a photon we've talked about um, is H nu, right? Um, I actually have a general chemistry video kind of going through why this is the expression for the energy of a photon. Um, and I'll link to that video with this one. Uh, but this is the energy of a photon, right? A packet of, of H nu, right? Just like Planck's law. And this experimental insight tells us, or it, it suggests that the, uh, the electrons must be having some collision with a particle like uh, property, right? Some particle like projectile. And that is the photon. The photon is a particle like projectile that is actually colliding with the electron, transferring energy and causing it to become a photoelectron, right? So this is really a particle like projectile. Now, why is this a big result? Well, this is a big result because electromagnetic radiation is always treated as a wave, right? It's not really treated as a particle. In classical mechanics, waves and particles are treated separately and their properties don't really overlap. But here we see a first glimpse of what's known as wave-particle duality, 
right? So you've probably heard about this already explained in, in some general chemistry context, and this is going to be a key insight for us in quantum mechanics. Um, sometimes you treat waves with part, or sometimes waves exhibit particle-like properties and particles exhibit wave-like properties. And this wave-particle duality is really on display here in the photoelectric effect. Something that we usually treat as a wave, electromagnetic radiation, is here clearly exhibiting a particle-like property, right? So we call those particles photons, and they each carry an energy of H nu, right? Where nu is the frequency and H is Planck's constant. Okay, so now let's build up a model to explain the photoelectric effect so that we can kind of be able to calculate the kinetic energy and the velocities of these uh, ejected photoelectrons. So what I've drawn here, this is just a y-axis where energy is this y-axis, and I've drawn a dotted line to represent the zero point, right? Because we know it has to cross some threshold before a photoelectron is ejected, right? So, um, so I want to kind of draw out a mental map here of the model of the photoelectric effect, right? So there's going to be some energy that's necessary to cross before we get any energy past this zero point, right? The energy that's necessary to eject a photoelectron. This energy we're going to call the work function, or it's referred to as the work function. And we use the Greek letter phi or phi, depending on how your professor says it, um, the Greek letter phi. Um, and this is going to be the work function. And all this is, is just the energy required to eject a photoelectron. So this is the energy required to eject photoelectron. Right, and we know that once that photoelectron is ejected, it's going to have some kinetic energy. So we're gonna put that up here. Right, so this is the energy, the kinetic energy of the photoelectron, so this is Ke of the photoelectron. Right now, thinking about the incoming, the energy of the incoming photon, right? By the law of conservation of mass, it has to be equal to the sum of these two, right? So we'll put that off to the side here, right? Where this is going to be the energy of the photoelectron, of the photon, excuse me. So this is the energy of the photon, which is gonna be H nu, some frequency, right? So think about it, like the cons conservation of energy um, has to be, a, has to be uh, respected here, right? Because that photon is going to have to give the electron enough energy to overcome that work function, and it's gonna have to give it enough energy to have its, its kinetic energy, right? So this is purely a part or treated in this model as a pure particle collision between the electron and the photon where that energy of the photon is transferred to the photoelectron, right? So this can be written out as an equation, right? Where the kinetic energy of the photoelectron, right? This Ke is just gonna be the difference between the energy of the photon and the work function, right? So you'll have H nu minus phi. And since we know that the kinetic energy of any particle is one half mv squared, we can actually use this equation to calculate the velocity of any photo ejected photoelectron, right? All we have to do is just put in one half mv squared here, right? And we can use this equation to calculate the uh, velocity of the photoelectron, right? So from this model, we know that a photoelectron will not be ejected um, if the work function is, uh, if unless the work func if the work function is greater than H nu, right? So if we have H nu, is less than the work function, right? So if this energy of the photon is less than that work function, 
then you have no ejection. So no photoelectron. Right, if that energy of the photon falls below this dotted line, then you get no kinetic energy. You get no photoelectron. And this is consistent with what we saw in the experimental plots because the kinetic energy has a linear dependence on the frequency via this equation. Right, so this sets up a model for the photoelectric effect. In the next video, we'll look at an example problem uh, applying this model to a problem of using the photoelectric effect.